Good evening, my name is Nina Khrushcheva and I teach international affairs here at the New School. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all today to a conversation about Russia, uh, its pro-democracy movement, and the future of Russia beyond Vladimir Putin. We do talk a lot about Vladimir Putin, but let's talk also about something else as well. Uh, this event co-organized uh, co by uh, International Affairs Program, uh, the Pan American Center, and the Train Foundation. Uh, it is an incredibly timely meeting, as we always say when we talk about Russia. Because, of course, every day is an incredibly timely meeting when we talk about Russia. Uh, in fact, nowadays, there is rarely uh, a newscast, morning news card starts with anything that is not a Russian story. Uh, Putin did something or didn't do something, something that, uh, even if it's not connected with Russia, it is a little bit about Russia. Uh, although in recent days, I think Russia has been slightly off the headlines, uh, but uh, what I'm specifically thinking about uh, when I say that things are about Russia, even if they're not, uh, I am referring to the disappearance of a Saudi Arabia dissident journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, which has been a story um, very, very important to our discussion today as well. It's about disappearance, it's about free speech, it's about opposition movement. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, as well as our major topic, which is Russia. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning that story is because when his disappearance and maybe murder by the Saudi officials were first reported in Turkey, analysts immediately stated that if Saudi Arabia denied any involvement, and it did deny any involvement, that they did take a page from the Kremlin playbook. So even if that story that is not relevant to Russia, Russia came about right away. Um, that, that was a reference to the Sergei Skripal case. Skripal, as you may remember, is a former spy and a nemesis of Putin, and he was poisoned in England together with his daughter um, last March. Um, Russia was accused of that and of that poisoning, but the Kremlin was incensed by this accusation, just like the Saudi Arabia was a few days ago. Um, and in fact, NBC News, um, for example, just a few days back announced that the Saudi crown prince is like the early Putin, uh, Putin of the 2000s, under whose regime many journalists and opposition leaders disappeared. Donald Trump now, very hesitant in calling the uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, on the Khashoggi disappearance is also framed in Putin's terms, which I found interesting. So um, the rhetoric there is that if Saudi Arabia is not punished, then Putin would further act with impunity, which is true. Uh, so one of the punishments suggested uh, is the Global Magnitsky Act. The punishment to Saudi Arabia is the Global Magnitsky Act. To remind you what it is, it is named after the Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who uncovered a Russian government corruption scandal, uh, cor scandal, sorry, corruption scheme in 2008 and was arrested for that and sub subsequently died in police custody. The Magnitsky leg legislation allows the U.S. to freeze assets and ban visas for gross human rights violations of individuals who are not just Russian officials, but all officials across the globe. So at times, Russia is an obsession in America, and at times I personally, and I know a lot of people who get very tired of that, but it's also a validated obsession, I believe. So as you could see, Russian story nowadays has become a global story. It's not just between Russia and the United States, but it is about Russia and all these other countries, and a litmus test for a lot of countries and people's behavior as well. So to better understand Russia's own situation in regard to human rights and free speech, I would like to turn to Paulina Kavalova, who is kind enough to join us today. Uh, she is the head of Eurasia, Eurasia Project at Pan America. Pan America is our co-sponsor. I'd like to welcome Pan America here. Uh, Paulina came to New York and Pan from Paris, where she worked with the UNESCO division of freedom of expression and media development, and she also worked at the Habitat Pro Association, which is an NGO 
advocating for indigenous uh, rights of women and youth. It is my pleasure to welcome Paulina Kovalova to deliver her brief remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, the New School, for hosting this event today. Actually, the second event uh, in last week together with Pan America. So I think this is the best proof that the uh, collaboration works very well and effectively. So thank you. Um, so let me take a minute and tell you a little bit about Pan America and our Eurasia work which um, actually uh, started in the beginning of 2016, well, started accelerating, I would say, in the beginning of 2016 when we invited a number of uh, writers and journalists uh, to New York, and they told us that no matter the open borders uh, in Russia right now, there is a, a, an obvious lack of um, a free flow of information, and hunger for a uh, free exchange of uh, free thoughts in Russia. So that was the moment when we started an, uh, uh, um, a, few, a few programs, and one of those um, was a, f a writers and dialogue program when we brought American writers to Moscow and Russian writers to New York for a series of uh, cultural exchanges. We also supported uh, young, brilliant uh, digital entrepreneurs uh, in the field of media and uh, culture and brought them to New York and San Francisco. And uh, of course, the number of uh, writers from Eurasia and Russia um, uh, participating in our World Voices Festival is also growing. But I specifically want to um, stress our advocacy work, uh, when we advocate for the uh, release of unjustly imprisoned writers and artists in Russia. And one of those is Alexensov, a Ukrainian filmmaker who um, who was uh, not afraid to speak up um, against the unlawful annexation of uh, Crimea, his native Crimea, by Russia. Uh, and so now he's imprisoned in uh, deep in Siberia, in Russia, in Panel Colony uh, for more than four years. So recently he was on hunger strike for 145 days. He was uh, on hunger strike requesting the release of more than 70 uh, Ukrainians uh, unjustly imprisoned in Russia, not requesting the release of himself. So why I, I want to stress this right now, because he is, he of course, like he stopped the hunger strike, but during this 145 days, he destroyed his health. And we don't know how long he will survive right now. But what is very important to me is that he started this movement of people uh, educating people about the political prisoners, uh, the problem of political prisoners in Russia. And this movement is all around the world, but particularly in Russia, it is important because what happens is that with, uh, with the lack of free press, the role that press should be doing, uh, playing, uh, people started playing. So this is just one example, and um, I'm very curious to hear more examples and to hear more about pro-democracy movement right now in Russia and what, what happens in Russia right now. Um, so I'm not going to take more of your time, and I will turn to you, Nina, to you, um, introduce our extraordinary panelists. Thank you so much. Here is me back again. Um, I was supposed to be just an introducer, but then in a Me Too era, they decided that it's nice to have a woman on the panel as well. So here we are. Um, so first, let me really introduce my wonderful, our wonderful guests here, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, uh, who is a winner of the uh, Civil Courage Prize uh, of 2018. Uh, and the prize is given by the Train Foundation, so it's a really great honor to first, um, I think it's his first time at the new school. Uh, maybe actually my speakers can come out because it's kind of bizarre to introduce them when they're standing out there. Thank you. 
So this is Vladimir Karamurza, who is the winner of the Civil Courage Prize, very courageous man indeed. Uh, and he's the uh, vice chair chairman of the Open Russia Movement. He's also the chairman of the Boris Nemtsov Foundation uh, for Freedom. I think that's the name, right? Boris Nemtsov Foundation for Freedom. Um, uh, Vladimir was once a Russian politician, very critical of Vladimir Putin, his namesake. Uh, and his Vladimir Putin's rule. He was instrumental in the passage of the Magnitsky Act that I was that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and he himself was a victim of uh, for his critical views because he was poisoned twice, and it's widely believed that uh, it was for uh, indeed his um, uh, his uh, his views um, of, um, uh, of of Vladimir Putin. Uh, there was a wonderful film that um, uh, Vladimir. Karamurza directed, uh, I think it was 2016, a few years ago, called Nimtsov. And Nimtsov was a great opposition leader, a very good friend of, of Vladimir. And um, I think David and I both, um, both knew him as well. Uh, he was uh, gunned down next to the Kremlin wall in a very brutal way, killed in 2015, once again for his, uh, for his views. Um, uh, uh, Vladimir Karamurza writes for the Washington Post, for the Wall Street Journal. He has written books uh, and uh, um, uh, really a great contributor to um, kind of the Russia that we want to imagine without Vladimir Putin. So I really would like to welcome Vladimir here uh, once again. And, and congrats and congratulate him on, on the prize yet again. Um, David Remnick, our guest, who has been around the new school um, actually before. I remember one time, some time ago, we, we had a panel I was running here, a Russian project on Russian democratization. So that ship has failed, has sailed and failed too. Um, and so David was a participant in that. But I first remember David uh, in the late 1980s, it's le that long ago, still the Soviet Union, and he was a young, brilliant reporter for the Washington Post. Um, his knowledge of Russia uh, had ultimately resulted in one of probably the best, and from my point of view, the best book ever written on uh, Russia in transition from communism to post-communism, not that it helped us a lot, um, uh, called Lenin's Tom and the Last Days of the Soviet Empire. He received the Pulitzer Prize for that book. Uh, he authored other five books. Uh, you all read him in The New Yorker. Um, he essentially needs no introduction in this audience or probably every other audience um, as well. In 2016, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome our participants in a conversation, and I'm very honored that they allowed me also to participate in that conversation. Thank you. Here is my chair. Now we have the awkward moment when I ask, does the microphone work? You here? Everybody's happy? Um, so my job is I'm the uh, moderator. And I should say that uh, Nina Khrushchev is um, the author of many books and a forthcoming book with Jeffrey Taylor called In Putin's Footsteps, which will take you to seemingly every metropolis and village from one end of Russia to the others, what they used to call all the Russias. And it's, it's, it's an extraordinary book, or at least the two-thirds of it that I've read. So it you know, may go all downhill from there, but I, I think it's, <laughs> it's quite, quite amazing. Um, I want to start off with a, a, a general sense um, of what Putin, we're talk, constantly talking about Putin this, Putin that, what Putinism is. Um, you both know very well about what Soviet communism is, and everybody here has a concept of that. Putinism is often um, just limited to a, a personality, a bare-chested, uh, slightly ominous or very ominous uh, a visage and all the rest. But what is the system that we're talking about? Maybe we'll start with Nina and then, and, and then we'll yeah. OK, um, just very briefly. Putinism is, of course, ism is assigned to all these regimes with often with strong leaders or strong ideologies. Putinism doesn't really have an ideology. It's a man ideology, one man ideology. It's similar to Peronism, which was in Argentina at a certain period. 
but generally it is a strong hand rule with some possibility of, um, it's not even dissent, I guess, some possibility of uh, slight ability to free think to uh, some free press. So in some ways, it is the oppression that is not entirely closing the system, but allows some, um, uh, allows some steam to get out. And in this way, I think Putinism, the strong man with a strong, um, with a strong apparatus of, uh, of control, uh, with the reasonably somewhat controlled media, uh, is also very dangerous and dangerous in a sense then it still has, and maybe Vladimir corrects me if disagrees, it still allows for an illusion that there is some freedoms available. And therefore, in some ways, it is more dangerous and longer lasting than Stalinism. In fact, it's already lasted um, longer than um, other previous regimes of one person in the Soviet era. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. First of all, I want to thank our hosts, uh, the New School, uh, for having this conversation tonight. And also thank you to Pan America and the Train Foundation for co-organizing uh, this meeting. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And please forgive me if I appear a little puzzled from time to time. Two days ago, I was in a small remote village in the Kostroma region. And now I'm in the city of New York, which is a pretty big contrast. So please bear with me. Uh, as, as, we, as we move this conversation forward. But uh, David, thank you for the question. It's, uh, I think it's a, it's a very important one. And uh, um, I think I would say, uh, kind of as a, as a direct answer to your question, is that the, the only real ideology, if we can call it that, of the current regime, the only real ideology of Putinism is to steal as much money as possible and to keep power for as long as possible to protect that money. That is the essence and the foundation of this regime. Now, of course, they can't say that because it doesn't sound very good. So they have to kind of hide this, hide this behind different fake ideological models, be it Eurasianism or the Russian world or whatever other models they come up with. And they use different people uh, like Korginyan or Dugin or whoever else to, to hide behind uh, certain ideological facades. But this is all, this is all just a pretense. Uh, they have no ideology beyond uh, keeping the money and staying in power. And they have, for now, been pretty successful at it. Mr. Putin has now been in power for almost 19 years. December 31st will mark his, uh, his 20th year in power. Uh, of course, he came to power on December 31st, 1999. Uh, and it's worth remembering that we now have a whole generation in our country who have no other political memories except for the current regime. He has now been in power for almost two decades. So the people who, Russian citizens who turned 18 and went to vote for the first time in a so-called presidential election in March of this year were people who were born under Vladimir Putin. This is how long he's been in power. Um, but I think what is also remarkable uh, is that if you look at what's been happening over the past year, year and a half, two years, with these protests that have been going on all across Russia, literally from Kaliningrad to Khabarovsk, against Putin's rule and against the corruption and against the abuses and against the authoritarianism, we would see that the bulk of those protesters were young people, were the generation that is, we can call it for the sake of brevity, the Putin generation, the people who were born and raised under the current regime, the people who you would think how, how would be the most you... brainwashed. So you, you did a, a brilliant set of films on, on the dissidents um, in 2005 called They Chose Freedom. And it involved Yelena Bonner, uh, Andrei Sakharov's wife. Um, it involved, it, it involved a core of dissidents that really popped up in the late 60s as a reaction to many things, not least of which was the invasion of Prague, the invasion of Czechoslovakia to uh, put an end to Prague Spring. These people, in the end of the day, were very small in number, very small in number. However heroic they were, however much media attention they got from the likes of uh, generations of Western correspondents and prizes and all the rest. And they were diverse also in their ideology, ranging from Solzhenitsyn to Sakharov and all the rest. Absolutely. In the end, however influential they were, the real revolution that came, the decisive one, came first from above. And the, the one that was able to really reach the masses of people. And I'm not discounting for a second the, the moral heroism or the influence of dissidents. Not for a second would I denounce, uh, uh, minimize that. 
Is there any sign whatsoever? You, you speak of demonstrations, and certainly there were mass demonstrations on Bolotnaya Ploshed and, and, and a number of other places years ago. And more recently, there are smaller ones having to do with pension reform and, and, and all the rest. But when you talk about real reform, I put the question to both of you, real change in Russia, is not, does that not hinge on the mortality, the political mortality, or the actual body, bodily mortality of one man? Well, we were just, uh, before we came here on stage, we were just thinking back and remembering August of 1991 and how uh, you were then the Washington Post correspondent in Moscow and you were covering that coup. And I'm old enough to remember that coup, unlike all those young people who are going out to protest today who remember you, nothing. You so were in the first grade, if I remember. No, I was in the, in the fifth grade, Excellent. so please don't underestimate <laughs> my age. But you know what I can tell you? When you see a revolution happening in front of your eyes, that's not something you forget, however young you are. And 10 years old is age enough to remember a revolution. And unfortunately, it's too young to participate, uh, but certainly old enough to understand what is happening. And you know what? That left a really lasting impression, I think, that will stay with me for as long as I live. Because, you know, we all saw a system that had stood for decades, and that was one of the most horrendous and one of the most repressive regimes in the history of civilization, collapse in three days. Three days. And there was nobody at the beginning of August of 1991 who said, that by the end of the month, there would no longer be a Soviet regime, and by the end of the year, there would no longer be a Soviet Union. If somebody said that, he would have been herded off to a lunatic asylum, but that is exactly what happened. And I think there's an important lesson uh, in Russian history that big political changes in our country very often start quickly, suddenly, and unexpectedly. And it's not just 91. We can, we can, we can cite many examples. I don't think that Vyacheslav Plever, the Tsarist interior minister, when he boasted but, 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 in 1904. But you had a reforming czar in power in 1991, right? You had, you, you, you had a fractured communist party. There were a lot of things out in the open in the leadership that were either weak or fractured and the rest. And you had a reforming czar. And you know, as in before, right before the French Revolution, you know, in Tocqueville, they say that the, week of the, the time of revolution is when the, the czar is a reformer. Um, you don't have a reforming czar, not by any stretch of the imagination now. So what, yes. what gives you this? Well, I actually just want to follow up because I think Vladimir is completely right that those kind of revolutions happen when you least expect, when you think that the system is the most stable and stagnant. And Russian system is rather stagnant today. And in stagnant system, you actually don't have to have a reforming czar. Uh, but what I think is interesting also, since we talk about 91, we talked about Putinism. It is all on one man, but it is also in the country that have never been as open to the world as it, Russia ever was. And so that allows you to like the great Russia that, I mean, I slightly disagree with you. I don't think it's all about the money because I think ideology of great Russia, sort of the, we make Russia great again uh, is, is, is very big, is very big there. I mean, it can be, it's a colossus on clay, uh, clay legs, but it's still a big, big thing. What I find interesting about uh, something that Vladimir says, and it's not the 91 story, is that there is a lot of horizontality. And when I traveled across Russia, and our conversation today is that what Russians outside of Moscow may think is that yes, there's no alternative, or Putin doesn't allow an alternative, but there's also this life that is not related to Putin. And what I saw, I don't know if you were there during the World Cup. You weren't, maybe. Not during I the was Cup. there during the World Cup, and I find the stunning development there that Putin did bring the World Cup. It was his achievement. He made not just Moscow, but other Russian cities very attractive for people to visit. I mean, it worked well. Uh, Russia presented itself well, but what it also did in talking about the revolution from no longer from above anymore, but it was that horizontality of people becoming responsible for their own, um, for their own hospitality. So suddenly that World Cup became people's World Cup. It was no longer Putin's cup. In fact, Putin embarrassed, and people felt embarrassed when you remember at the very end, they were standing under this pouring rain, <laughs> and two presidents, the um, uh, the French and the Slovenian president was standing there without the umbrella, and Putin was standing with the umbrella. And Russians were like, wait a minute, we just had this amazing event, and you were embarrassing us like that. You're a real czar. So that was that moment when Russians suddenly thought, we don't need to be great because Kremlin tells us mm. so. We actually can be great. And I think that what allows 
for I think that's what at least I believe that the change has started because suddenly if you look at the elections, not in Moscow, but the local elections uh, in, uh, uh, in the Far East right now, suddenly all the Putin candidates are not making it through. They're communist candidates, they're other candidates, but that was people voting against the United Russia Party, which is Putin's party, voted against, not because they want that communist, but because they're giving the Kremlin a message. Well, I, we want it different. Um, I, did you finish your point? Um, it, it seems to me that, that um, Putin is immensely more sophisticated in, in his handling of press and dissent than the late Soviet leaders. Immensely more sophisticated. In other words, the gulag cost enormous amounts of money. It was an immense system. K killing people and having complete control, completest control over the press is an enormously sophisticated, expensive thing, and it's now probably impossible in the age of the internet and, and, and ways to communicate. You walk into a bookstore now, certainly in Moscow, you can buy as you like. You want to buy Solzhenitsyn, you want to buy Sakharov's memoirs, you want to buy uh, untold things, no problem. To the literary buying community, no problem. Television, where everybody gets their news, is an entirely different story. You get nothing. You, 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 you are as blind to, to the realities of news as you were in 1975. You don't just get nothing. You get aggressive pro-Kremlin propaganda on every single nationwide television channel. You yes, get worse it, than nothing. Well, 1975 wasn't unaggressive. But, but I, I would say this. In their handling of dissidents, they seem, the, the system seems different. That you, what your experience was to be a target, with, to be a selective, high profile target, which is a very different way of doing business than in the late Soviet period. Um, when you watch what happened in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, in the last week or two, you must feel a great shiver of recognition. Of, you must, in some way, feel Khashoggi is, in some way, you. Uh, well, you're certainly right in the sense that the, the, the model of repression has changed. And if, you know, before, back just, in the Just as MBS is trying to change the model of repression and, 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 and style of leadership in, in Saudi Arabia. Right. And it's, it doesn't have to be, they realize that it doesn't have to be on a mass scale. Uh, you can select targets, but they have to be very visible targets and they have to send a message to everybody else. When the leader of the opposition is assassinated on a bridge in front of the Kremlin, in the middle of Moscow, in the most protected area, probably in the whole of Europe. You've been there many times. You know, you can't even stand for, for a minute on that bridge without mm -hmm. plainclothes police officers coming to you. Um, and that's, that's the place that was chosen for the murder. That sends a message to millions. So they're, they're doing it more efficiently now. They're doing it differently. But let's not also forget that um, the, old, uh, the old habits are still there as well. And if we want to talk about, for example, political prisoners in Russia today, uh, the latest figures from Memorial are something like 180 people, political and religious prisoners in Russia. And they use, by the way, a very restrictive criteria. They use the, um, the criteria set out in um, Resolution 1900 of the Parliamentary mm -hmm. Assembly of the Council of Europe mm -hmm. of what and who constitutes a political prisoner. So in reality, there are many more than 180. But that, that's the number uh, that, that they determined according to these restrictive criteria. And even that number is higher than, for example, the late Brezhnev period. If, uh, if we look back at Andrei Sakharov's, you mentioned him several times today, if you look at Sakharov's Nobel Peace Prize lecture that he wrote and couldn't deliver, Elena Bonner read it out for him in, in Oslo in December 1975, he said in that lecture that I'm dedicating this to the prisoners of conscience of my country. And he listed 126 names. Now, those are, were only the people he either knew personally or he knew of. So that was not an exhaustive list, yeah. but neither is the list by Memorial today. And the figure today, in 2018, under Vladimir Putin, is higher. The figure of political prisoners in Russia is higher than the figure was under Leonid Brezhnev in 1975. So let's not also discount those old Soviet-style, KGB-style methods. Yeah. They're very much you, alive and You talked and in about the collapse today. of the regime in 1991. Did it really collapse? And did, isn't it, in fact, a, a reality that much of the regime either stayed right in place or went into business and revived itself, particularly the security services? Well, unfortunately, it, wasn't, it was definitely not finished off. And I think one of the biggest mistakes of the Yeltsin presidency and generally of, of, of our government in the early 90s was that they didn't finish off. They didn't turn the page completely, as 
uh, governments in our neighboring countries in Central and Eastern Europe did. I mean, they had, depending on country, they had different models that were implemented. In some countries, they had lustrations, which was a, a ban on political office mm -hmm. for representatives of the old regimes or their security services in other countries. They had opening of the archives and completely making public, shedding light on the old crimes uh, of, the, of the defeated regimes. We had a little bit of that at the beginning of the 90s. We had some opening of the archives. We had that sort of trial of the Communist Party. You remember in the Constitutional Court, you were there to cover it in mm -hmm. 1992. Which, by the way, it's very significant as well that the verdict of that trial, the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation, at that time the highest court in the land, this was before we joined the Council of Europe, because now the highest court in Russia is the European Court of Human Rights, but back then it was the Constitutional Court. And the outcome of that case against the Communist Party was that the court found that the communist regime had been responsible for the repressions against millions of people. Mm -hmm. This is not a statement by an NGO or human right, yeah. rights group. This was a verdict by the highest court of the Russian Federation. But it so was it was significant. It was highly ceremonial. Six people would come a day, maybe seven. It was. It was. And nobody cared. And the archives were open for a little bit, and they were shut right back down right. again. The lustrations law that Galina Starovoytova twice introduced into the Russian parliament was not passed, as we know. Who was murdered. And there was, who was in 1998. Uh, and, and as we know, of course, uh, no limitations of any kind were imposed against operatives of the former regime. Otherwise, we would not have had a colonel of the Soviet KGB come to power in 1999. So that, I think, if, I were to, if you were to ask me what I think was the biggest mistake of the Yeltsin presidency, it wasn't the economic policies. It wasn't, no, there were many mistakes made, no question about it. I think that was the biggest one, that they failed or refused to completely finish off the old system but in we, the way that our neighbors did. But Nina, weren't we colossally naive, colossally naive, to think that after a thousand years of absolutism in Russia, at Russia and seven plus decades of communism in, in the Soviet Union, the democratization would come traipsing onto the stage in, in a kind of um, a stable and wonderful way in the 90s and thereafter? Well, absolutely, and I think you did write that in the Lenin's home very well already then, that it's impossible to believe that, and one of the things that I did when I traveled through Russia's 11 time zones is to see how enormous this country is. And when you have such an enormous space, thinking that it's just going to be doing all these things that democracies do because um, people suddenly decide that they're going to follow orders, I mean, they're follow, going to follow rules, there's no such thing because rules in Kamchatka is very different than rules in Kaliningrad. So that's one thing. But another thing I think is a, is a um, slight of a problem and going back to the Putinism is that that exactly when you kill and then Khashoggi's death and sort of these new modern autocracies function this way. You threaten just a few. So the rest, you don't need the gulags anymore. You threaten people one by one and that's how you eliminate the opposition because people start thinking whether they should be speaking, speaking out or not. But I also think with the, with the communist regime, the collapse of the communist regime is one of the mistakes. I mean, we all thought when Yeltsin came in and he was very brave speaking against communism, but he himself was really very communist leader. I mean, he declared anti-communism, but a lot of methods that he employed were ruling by decree, putting together um, sort of divide and conquer, putting together groups that worked with him, worked for him, was very communist. And so expecting that there's gonna be a new system operating by people who denounced communists but remained the same kind of mentality was a very wrong was a very wrong idea. And I think Vladimir is completely correct is that it didn't, really didn't they didn't finish up the let, let me ask what, could I just very quickly because I think you raised a very important point and I just want to in response to what you said, I really want to caution against this predeterminism that so many people unfortunately apply when they speak about Russia that as you put it, a thousand years of absolutism, seven decades of communism, it means that democracy is not possible there. No, it does not mean that. Because there were so many countries that had lived under absolutism, that had lived under various kinds of dictatorships, and that are successful and thriving democracies today. And there's no reason why our country cannot have Who? a thriving and successful democracy. Well, Spain, Germany, mm -hmm. the most Latin American countries, I can, I can go on for hours. And, and, and really, I mean, it's to good be honest, to, It's good to applaud that, but if you come out of the Soviet experience, if you look at the various republics, or if you look at Eastern Europe, it's, 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 the experience is not uniformly wonderful, and it's not just Russia. Uh, we look at Central Asia, we look at, you know, uh, all over the place. Even, even, even in the wonderful Czech Republic, 
we're now seeing a movement backwards. Well, of course, it's never, backwards. it's never linear. It's, yeah. it's never one-sided. United States, backwards. But, but we'll get to that in a second. Right. We'll get to Not that likely. in a second. I have, you have enough Russians meddling into your domestic affairs. Yes. I don't think I'm going to comment on the US thing. <laughs> but I really do I'm want to. I'm glad you raised that. <laughs> I really do want to, because to, to be completely honest, as a Russian, it sounds insulting when people tell me that somehow we are worse or not worthy uh, of, not, of a system not, it's not a question that other of worthiness. countries do. It's not a question of possibility. It's just a, a matter of historical fact that histor history gets ingrained in a way that makes the already difficult even more difficult. The, the factors mitigating against a smooth transition to democracy were in, were in all ways difficult. That is absolutely true. But let me give you some facts in return. I'm, I'm a historian by education, so I always prefer to deal in facts as opposed to stereotypes. And if you look at the admittedly very few times in our history when Russian people could actually freely choose between dictatorship and democracy, they always chose democracy every single time. 1906, the first election to the State Duma. Supporters of the Tsarist autocracy, who had absolute control over everything, got zero seats in Parliament. Zero. The election was won by the cadets, the Constitutional Democrats, which was a leading pro-Western, pro What about, 19, what about pro 1996? Uh, hang on, you, you're yeah. jumping too far yeah. ahead. We will get to 90, no, we will get yeah. to 96. Yeah. 1906, the election to the first Duma, won by a pro-reform, pro-Western Liberal Party. 1917, the election to the Constituent Assembly, held in November, three weeks after the Bolsheviks had seized power by force, and they lost that election to a party, the SR, the Social Revolutionaries, that was a left of center admittedly economically very left-wing, but politically democratic party that advocated for a parliamentary republic as opposed to the dictatorship sure. of the proletariat. And they won that election handily, and the Bolsheviks had to disperse the assembly by force. 1991, we've been mentioning a lot, uh, a, a lot this year tonight. Uh, we're talking about August, but there was also June of 1991, sure. the first ever direct election for head of state in history in a thousand years, he put it, history of Russia, when Boris Yeltsin, who was a candidate for the democratic opposition, defeated the candidate of the ruling Communist Party, former Soviet Premier Nikolai Rishkov, by 57% to 17. These are the facts, not stereotypes. And if we do want to talk about 96, which I remember very well, um, we remember the state of the Russian economy. We remember how unpopular Yeltsin was. We already talked about the many mistakes that were made. And yet, most people went out and voted not so much for Yeltsin, but against the return of an unreconstructed Stalinist Communist Party represented by Gennady Zyuganov, mm -hmm. who told business people in Moscow two weeks before the election, you won't even have time to reach the would airport, you, as you, you will would remember. Would you consider 1996 a free and fair election? I would, because I remember you it well. Would. I remember especially, to me, the main barometer of a really free and fair election is, well, apart from the count, which is important, and there were no allegations of any major uh, counting fraud back then. But more importantly than that is the TV coverage. Uh, and back then... Which was dominated you would by? See, uh, it was, it was uh, dominated by... Yeltsin Media. Uh, but you know what? If you remember, were you still in Moscow in 96? Uh, all the time. Okay. So you remember that yeah. Zuganov was on national television? Yeah. Yevlinsky was on national television? Yeah. Alexander Lebed, who came number three uh, in the election result, was all the time on national television? This is completely, this is nothing like what we have today, nothing. That's for sure. So there's a lot That's of this. A, that is absolutely There's a sure. lot of this revisionist uh, kind of view now that mm. try to say that the 96 election was well, not. We are, we are 95 percent on the same page. But when all the oligarchs under Yeltsin get together and go to Davos and decide to throw all their money and their power behind Boris Yeltsin in order to get Boris Yeltsin, who's barely able to stand up, elected president, Something is wrong in the state of Denmark. I, it, I just want to know. say, I actually, unfortunately, I disagree with you and agree with David. That was not a democratic election. It was a Yeltsin election. And as often elections happen in Russia, is that the choice between the lesser evil, which is always a very, very bad choice. And I do agree that when people have a choice, they would use, they would choose probably not an autocrat, but that's the problem with Russia, not that it is a deterministic in any way, that unfortunately every time when a reformer comes, the reformer in Russian history never lasts more than six, eight years, because something that reformer does uh, doesn't sit well with that vast space, which is very incredibly difficult, difficult to rule, or that's how the system su suggests very difficult to rule. And I think that's what where Russia, uh, what Russia needs to overcome is that, and that's what I mean well, by the, the, democratization from 
uh, from sort of below. That's what happened, I believe, during the World Cup, that suddenly all these territories decided that they can present themselves to the world as Russians. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a central. But to both of you, what scenario do you see, other than the death of a, an autocrat, where, where better would come? In other words, what is your optimistic view of Russian political development? The pessimistic view is in plain sight. What's your optimistic view? What, what would happen? What can happen? What's possible in the Russia of today where there would be forward movement in terms of democratization mm -hmm. and freedom? Well, we talked a few minutes ago about how political change in Russia comes quickly and unexpectedly, and we've cited all those far back historical examples, right. including, as you rightly pointed out, I was in school back in 91, but you know, I was already an adult in 2011, uh, seven years ago. And if somebody said to me in September of 2011, the day when Putin and Medvedev did the Rekirovka, the, 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 the right? castling maneuver, if somebody said to me that day then that three months from now there will be 150,000 people standing mm. in the middle of Moscow demanding Putin's resignation, I would have said that person is crazy. You know, for years, question. for years, we would, you know, if we would be lucky to have a few hundred people at an but, opposition But as you know, a hundred times better than I do, if there's, if there's one fear that lives within the heart and brain of Vladimir Putin, it is precisely that. It's the Orange Revolution, it's the Absolutely. Rose Revolution, Absolutely. it's Tahrir Square. They're paranoid about it. Uh, of course, and in fact, the KGB under uh, uh, in, in Gorbachev's time, in order to scare Gorbachev, would give reports to Gorbachev saying they will throw ladders over the Kremlin walls. This was the, the terms. There were reports. We have them. Right. We have these documents. Right. And in a more sophisticated way, Putin actually has. First of all, he has visible evidence of where this has happened in other in other ca foreign capitals. Uh, whether in f former Soviet capitals or in the Arab world or elsewhere, he's terrified of this, and his, all his political actions seem built around Absolutely. the prevention of this. Absolutely. So when he came back, that was the end of 150,000 people. That was why he was so angry at Hillary Clinton. That was why he got behind, in whatever way he got behind, Donald Trump. I thought we did well not saying the word Donald Trump <laughs> until right now. So let me, let me raise it. Right. Do you think the Soviet regime today, the Soviet regime, I, I just aged myself. Freudian that, slip, no, sorry, you didn't not, really. Not even yeah. Freudian. Yeah. That, that the Russian leadership now feels they got quite the guy they wanted. Do you think they're happy with Donald Trump? First of all, let me say at the outset that it's not for Donald Trump or for Angela Merkel or for Theresa May or for whoever of the Western leaders it's Western affect, confusion and weakness. To affect political change in our country. It's only for us. It's only for the citizens of Russia. It's only for Russian society. You know, this. If you, if you watch Kremlin propaganda channels, which I suppose you have to do for your work, but I would advise anybody who can help it not to watch it if you value nervous I, I system. Watched, uh, I, but if I you, watch Kisilyov every Sunday evening. I'm really sorry for you. I do. Uh, I, don't I, know. I lead a weird man. life. He's a brilliant man. Um, <laughs> he knows his propaganda. But so you know very well yeah. that um, having, having watched it a few times. This is called News of the Week. It's, it's on, on YouTube. I don't know if there's subtitled versions no. of it, but it's, it's, it's unbridled. Russian propaganda, and it's very... And it's Kremlin very propaganda, yeah. Does, yeah. By the way. It's, it's, it's quite unbelievable. It's not just, obviously, as you know, it's not just what he's saying, it's also how he's saying oh, it. It's, just, it's, 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 it's horrendous. But um, anyway, so having watched all of this stuff, you know well that you know, the kind of Kremlin propaganda line about people like me, my colleagues in the Russian opposition, is that we go to the West and that we supposedly ask Western leaders for money, money. or for political support. Right or to affect regime change in Russia, or whatever other nonsense they come up with. Of course, needless to say, I don't need to tell this audience that none of that is true. It's only for Russian citizens to affect political change in Russia. The only thing we do ask Western leaders, and that is absolutely true, and we ask them at every meeting, in every conversation, in every talks we have with them, is please stop supporting Vladimir Putin's regime by, first of all, treating him as a respectable and worthy partner on the global stage, which they have been doing for so many years. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, and this is where the Magnitsky Act that Nina mentioned earlier comes into force, please stop supporting the Putin regime by offering safe havens in the West 
for the cronies and crooks and the oligarchs in the Kremlin who steal in Russia but spend in Western countries, because this is their modus vivendi. This is what they do. The people who violate and abuse and attack the most basic norms of democracy and rule of law in our country then come to the West what makes and you, use the privileges what, what, and opportunities that these notions offer here. What Please makes, stop doing that. What makes you think that the American president cares at all about human rights? First of all, I didn't say that. No, I'm asking you. Do you think, do you, do you think this American president cares about human rights? I think specifically if, if we want to talk about Russia, which, which is what I feel competent in, I, I, I don't think it's my place to comment on other countries, but if we want to talk about the rule of law and democracy in Russia, then none of the recent US presidents cared about it. George W. Bush looked into Putin's eyes and got a sense of his soul. Barack Obama declared a reset with Putin and, and praised him for the great work he's doing on behalf of the Russian people. That's a quote. And you know, you, we just saw what happened in Helsinki a couple of months ago with the current US president. To, to be frank with you, there's no change. There may be a change in style do, do, in, a, in the president. Do you, think it's only, do you really think it's only stylistic? Yes, frankly, to be honest, I do. Because you know, when, when um, the Bratislava summit happened between Bush and Putin, this was eight weeks after Putin pulled the plug on, on the largest independent television channel in Russia, NTV, which was right. taken down in April 2001. In June 2001, Bush looked into Putin's eyes and got a sense and, of his And yet, and yet the, during the Nixon presidency, who's never thought of as a patsy for, for Soviet communism, Nixon followed a policy that was known as detente in which he, there, was, there, were, there were hardline aspects to that, to that policy. It was, you know, I'm no Nixon fan, but this was a reasonably sophisticated policy that you can argue with. But it was, it was not just uh, in one direction, that detente had to do with um, uh, uh, making agreements where agreements could be made and being hardline where hardline was demanded. Now, you could argue with the, the, the policy, but it wasn't all in one direction. Well, first of all, we have to say that since you, you mentioned earlier the Soviet dissident movement, all the most prominent figures in the Soviet dissident movement at the time were categorically against the so-called detente because they saw it actually as a one-way street of concessions uh, and compromises, one-way compromises towards the Kremlin, towards the Soviet system, and that's, and that's the same thing it but is today. But with respect, you have different jobs. A Russian dissident or a Soviet dissident has a very different job than a president of the United States that has different Of course, but no, what, what you, you're absolutely right about is that even you mentioned Nixon. Let's use Nixon as, a, as an example. He is not somebody who is views, viewed as a kind of a stalwart for human rights. That's not his reputation. And yet Nixon uh, got several prominent Soviet dissidents out of prison. Jimmy Carter was thought to be a, 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 the, the, the prime advocate of human rights. And yet, when it came to Afghanistan, um, you could argue easily that he was um, bowled over. But he also, if, Jimmy Carter also managed to get several very prominent, very high profile dissident from prisons in the Soviet Union, Alexander Ginsburg, for example, Edward Kuznetsov in 79. Right. Nixon got out of prison, Vladimir Drumluga, who was one of the seven mm -hmm. people who came out on Red Square in August 68 to protest against the invasion of Czechoslovakia, one of those prominent representatives of the dissident movement. And Nixon got him out of prison. Carter got Ginsburg and Kuznetsov. Reagan got God knows how many people. He would start every meeting with the Soviet leadership by putting, on, by putting down a table lists of political prisoners that he demanded to be released. If we look at the past few US presidents, they didn't, they didn't get anybody. The only high profile did, political. Did we, forgive me, did we, make, did we make Putinism too easy for Putin? In other words, by all our colossal screw ups abroad? Did we, yes, it, I think so. I in other words, when, when he gives a speech in Munich, and he basically says, stop lecturing me. I've yeah. been hearing about you know, uh, how you weren't going to expand in, you know the whole litany. You weren't going to expand in NATO, you expanded in NATO. You, you went into Iraq. I told you not to go into Iraq. It was a catastrophe from the word go. Lib all, all the, thi all the, the entire litany of it, whether it's the Balkans or, or, or the Middle East or, or many other areas. Did we make ideological and geopolitical life easy for Putin? Is that a legitimate I argument? think so. I actually think that it did make it very easy for Putin because when he came in, he very memorably in 2000 gave an interview, I think, to BBC, I think, and said that we're not afraid of NATO, we're going to build this. I mean, look, Putin is a KGB man. I hate saying that KGB is in his blood, but KGB is in his blood. So that's how we start. But he wanted, he was willing but, to but try. But explain how that's different than George H.W. Bush, who was the head of the CIA. <laughs> but, but, no, I'm but, no, no, I, 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 get, I get that point. So uh, how many of you, when, say, 20 years ago, thought of CIA as part of your life? 
At the new school? At the new school, (laughs) well, okay. At the new school, okay, 10%. Yeah. But when you're a Soviet citizen, you think of KGB 90% of your time because your phone is being listened to. And even if you don't know it, sometimes I remember when I was little and I was talking about Brezhnev, there was the last, you know, we talk about Detente and Nixon and, and Brezhnev. So I was talking about Brezhnev and how old he is and he really needs to die soon, which of course I think in America would be threatening American president or something. And so suddenly there is some click on the phone that says, hang up the phone. And like, what? I'm talking to somebody which is not whatever that man's voice was. So you do think about KGB 90% of your time, You, um, especially if you are from a family that is considered not to be part of the political establishment or once was of a political establishment like mine, but that no longer. So I think that is a big, very big difference. So when KGB man comes to power in Russia, the first thing, the first thought of people who are um, not dissident necessarily, but sort of this intellectual people who want Russia finally one day become a democratic country is that, okay, the communists, unless you're KGB, communists would scold you on the red carpet and say you, your knowledge of Marxism and Leninism is not great enough. But KGB would hang you on the trees. And so I remember that thought that when Putin came into power, in December 30, 30th, 31, 99, is that the time comes and he's going to hang us on the trees. That was the fear. And then he, there was this whole conversation about the bush and the soul and how they're going to build the world together. So it kind of evened out. So for people like me, it's not really a surprise where we, where we came to. But sort of go back to your question, uh, there was a, a great American diplomat and political philosopher George Kennan, he was at Princeton, uh, and uh, he, he was ambassador in Moscow during Stalin times, but he was very non-ambassadorial, so he actually made a sn- snooty remark about Stalin and that was kicked out of uh, his ambassadorial position in 24 hours. Uh, well, thankfully, was not killed. Uh, but was kicked out, and he was a very distinguished academic at Princeton. And he always would say that the problem with America is that lectures the world, but actually the greatest strength of America is not go militaristically anywhere or, el- or everywhere, but it is to act on American principles. And I think what happened since, particularly since 2000, since Putin time, he saw things that are hypocritical, he saw the American hubris, and as a KGB man, and that's how way KGB comes back, is that he's a KGB man, so he reads your weaknesses. That's why that incredible meeting in Helsinki was an incredible meeting in Helsinki because that was a KGB operative exactly. was essentially recruiting the American president who pull, who wilted like a tired flower right there in front of the world's eyes. Well, let, let's talk about American principles. Um, and maybe this is uncomfortable. It'd be, we have a president now who doesn't even pay lip service to human rights. You could see him struggling in the last few days, try, trying to find a way to turn the situation into something where uh, Mohammed bin Salman had nothing to do with this. He, it's speaks, the rogue he, he speaks glowingly of um, regimes, you know, whether it's Hungary or Poland or Russia. Uh, he, his tropism is toward the autocrat. His contempt is for the struggling uh, uh, democratic ally in Western Europe. His contempt is for Angela Merkel. His contempt is, is, is for people he judges to be weak or costing us money. Are, are we, it seems to me, and I, I don't want to load the question, but it seems to me what, what, what moral authority that we might have had well, however dwindling, however endangered, in places like Russia, we make your job, this president makes your job as a, as a Russian dissident immensely more difficult in terms of the prestige of, of the United States. Um, and I talk about the moral prestige, such as it is. Am, am I? First, if I could say a couple of words on your previous point, because I think it's very important. You, and, and obviously, I know that you know this much better than, than us, and you just use this rhetorically, kind of, you compared. 
Putin is a former KGB officer to George H. W. Bush, who was director of the CIA. Actually, I don't think it's a moral equivalent. I just raised it. Of course, no, no, no. You did. I, as, he, you did it as a rhetorical, and I understand it. And thank no, you for I, doing this. He's, he was one but, year at the top of the CIA. Right. He was not. He was not a. Uh, burning documents Precisely. in a, uh, in Precisely. a in That's a the furnace. point I, I, yes. I think yes. it's important to make is there's, there's absolutely no moral equivalence between a political appointee at the head of an intelligence service in a democratic nation yeah. and a career officer in a repressive organ of a totalitarian state you, you who no went to volunteer. You, you have no argument for me. Of course. That. No, I think yeah. you, since you raised that thing, yeah. it's important to put it. And um, uh, also, I, I want to say I think I completely agree with, uh, with Nina when she says that Everything that's happened under Putin is not surprising. And it's, what, what is surprising is that how many people refuse to see it at the time. And you know, there's all this talk in the Western kind of analytical circles about the, the early Putin and the middle right, Putin exactly. and the late Putin. All these mm -hmm. are, there wasn't an early Putin and no middle right. Putin. You know, you know, the they first call, they call it the early funny stuff. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, I can, Putin is Putin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and what he did was also the same. Obviously, it took time to gather speed, as it were. But the direction was set from the very beginning. I remember the day. I, it's literally the day when I understood who this man was and what he was about. And, and I can't claim that I was one of the early ones or people who understood this much, much, much earlier than me. When was that? But remember, the, the day was December 20th, 1999. He was still prime minister. Right. This was 11 days before he would become the acting president of Russia. Uh, that is, of course, as you know, the Chekist Day, which is still remarkably marked as an official holiday uh, to commemorate the founding of the Soviet secret police, the Chekai, in 1917. And on that day, Mr. Putin went to the Lubyanka Square in Moscow, the KGB FSB headquarters, to, to, unveil, to unveil a memorial plaque to Yuri Andropov. Now, Yuri Andropov was a KGB chairman in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. In Hungary in under whose, He also oversaw the invasion of uh, Hungary in 56 as a Soviet ambassador to Budapest. But as chairman of the Soviet KGB, he was responsible for the establishment of the fifth chief directorate, which was a directorate specifically tasked with suppressing and destroying political dissent. He was also uh, the official who expanded the practice of punitive psychiatry. When dissidents, people who were opposed to the communist regime, were declared mentally insane and basically kept in torturous conditions in, in mental hospitals and so on and so forth. And this is the guy Putin went to unveil a memorial plaque to. You know, if you needed a sense of the direction he would take, that's, that was it. Russia is a country of symbols, and that symbol was unmistakable. I and within the first year of his presidency, Putin brought back the music of the Stalinist Soviet national anthem in another unmistakable and clear sign. So there was never an early Putin. He was Putin from the beginning. Fair enough. But my question. I think the moral authority of the democratic world, including, of course, the, the main, the most important democratic nation in the world, the United States, doesn't rest on personalities or specific policies. It rests on, the, on your system of government, your system of the rule of law. Uh, and I think that's where it comes from. And as I said a few minutes ago, I don't think, uh, I, I know my, many of my American friends may disagree with this, but I don't think that on substance there is, a, there is that, that, that much of a difference in the approach that previous U.S. presidents took toward the Putin regime from, from what the current U.S. president does. I can tell you again that, you know, when, when Mr. Bush was looking into Putin's eyes, when the main independent television and seeing his soul, when the main television, independent television networks were being taken down. Yeah, this wasn't a good sight to see. When, when Barack Obama was cuddling with Kremlin leaders and declaring a reset, when we had dozens of political prisoners languishing in Russia, that wasn't a good sight to see. So it, to me, as a Russian opposition activist, there, there is no there substantive critical, difference. There are political prisoners in China. We do business with China. We have trade relations with China. We try to manage a diplomatic relations, probably the most important diplomatic relationship in the entire 21st century, is how to manage uh, the ascent of China vis-a-vis -vis the United States. There is never going to be in the real world of diplomacy a pure country dealing with a pure country on a pure level. Of course. I don't mean to be a complete moral relativist, but we all know that, 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 that that's the case. To, to equate the behavior vis-a-vis -vis Russia of Barack Obama and, 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 and Trump seems, seems curious. Uh, why? What's, what was different in substance? Because I have a, an American president go uh, in, in, in <laughs> it seems self-evident to me, but that's, that's a fair question. Well, uh, to me, it's, as a Russian opposition actor, it seems self-evident that didn't the policies find the were Helsinki, the same. You don't find his comments about murdered journalists, his kind of, well, we murder journalists here too. This is on the Morning Joe show. His, his incredible compliments about 
Vladimir Putin, you never heard that from the mouths of Barack Obama, ever. No, that is factually incorrect. When he went to Moscow for the first time in 2009, again, you, you would say, it's not you would my say place. the rhetoric of Obama and, and, and Donald Trump is the same when it comes to Vladimir Putin? Style is extremely different. The substance is exactly the same. But more important than rhetoric, the policy is exactly the same. OK, on this note, I actually would have loved to contribute to this, but I am we need questions gesture from you all. that I need questions to the audience, so maybe we can continue this. So I would like It's just self-evident that my, my, my good friend is, we, we, we disagree. We disagree, which is, which is <laughs> Which is fair good. And, and good. Which is fair. And, um, and so that's one of the strongest I, points of your system, that you can disagree and still walk out free of this room. Exactly. Nobody, nobody's going to be killed in this audience. Okay. I, I, by, the way, by the way, just remember what the, your tribe and my tribe have been called by the American president. Vrag naroda, Vrag enemy naroda. of the people. I don't think, uh, I think there's a, a palpable okay. difference there. Nobody, no, now you're venturing into U.S. domestic politics. That is Vrag not my place here. to comment. Fair enough. Nobody's I, I sense, we're talking about Russia. We're talking about Russia. Nobody's yeah. brought Naroda here. Okay. We are all friends of the people. So I would ask you please to queue next to the mics and please ask questions rather than make statements. We really don't have time for right. that. So questions, and if you are and not having not a question, don't ask. it's not about the Middle East, you want three points and an elaboration. So. <laughs> okay, so please. It, oh, it doesn't work? Maybe okay. there's like a button or something on that. So on the, it was a line. Yeah. Hello. Okay. May we start? <laughs> yes, so yes, Since we start. Vladimir, Vladimir, I'm a teacher at uh, Grace Church School, and I have a group of 23 students who are taking a course in modern Russian history, so um, we're tremendously impressed with your presentation and your activism. You're, you're an inspiration. So here are two students to ask some questions. Okay. Yes, please. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for fielding these questions. Um, so you talked briefly about um, the potential for Russia to have um, a liberation of media or free speech, um, and you specifically seemed hopeful that that was possible despite decades of, sorry, <laughs> despite decades of sort of like blockade coming from the government. Um, do you think that the like sort of perverted form of democracy that um, Russia is experiencing right now um, is severely uh, impeding that progress and moving towards real democracy? And also, um, what do you think it will take? And do you see any prospects right now um, within the government or someone uh, or a group of people that have the opportunity to make that sort of change? OK, so we're going to take a group of questions. Okay, so we'll sure. speed it up. So thank you sure. very much. So we'll take three more questions, and then we'll go to answers. Um, well, at least uh, with me, I'm also a student. I'm very interested in, 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 in the Kursk uh, submarine disaster. And, and given that that was one of the, the first major events that happened uh, during Putin's uh, presidency, uh, I'm interested to see what your reactions were to how the disaster was handled and um, why, the, uh, why kind of the new Russian state was so reluctant to receive help from the West uh, when they could have gotten it. And um, I'm just genuinely kind of interested to see why um, it took so long for anything to happen and why um, it kind of led to the death of, I think it was 23 sailors that they knew were alive and they kind of just left them in the submarine um, there. Of course, um, of course, 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 course. Yes, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course. Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think quite apart from what the president may say about, about Putin's soul, what the United States as a country says about what happens in Russia I think may be much more important. I think there's a recent example in Malaysia where a regime that had ruled that country for 60 years was overthrown in an unexpected defeat in an election in no small measure because of investigations in the United States about massive corruption by that government. And one could do the same thing with Putin and one could do much more to publicize his role in the bombings in Moscow that killed thousands of Russians and started another war. What do you think could be done if there was more attention in the Western media to the crimes of Putin and his thefts. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, hi. I'm a graduate student at the uh, Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Um, you dwelled on quite a lot about um, um, so the Soviet period and the unexpectedness of the democratization of um, Soviet Russia. 
And my question is just simply, um, is there not a crucial difference between Soviet Russia and Putin's Russia in that the Soviet system was a closed totalitarian one? So the dissidents, you know, apart from like the open ones like Solzhenitsyn, essentially had to be quiet, bide their time, stay in the system, and then break it down from within. Whereas Putin's Russia is, you know, authoritarian, but it's relatively open, and most of the dissidents, or at least the liberals that I know, are all just planning to emigrate rather than, you know, try and stick it out and hope that things will change. Thank you. Should, should we answer some, maybe? Yeah. 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 Go, okay. go ahead. Will. Thank you very much for that. And I'll, I'll actually start with the last question, because I, I think it's, it's a very important one. And, and first of all, not all liberals and Democrats are planning just to run off and emigrate. There are so many people who are ready to stay and to carry on the fight. In fact, there's nothing better that the Kremlin would like us to do than to all run. And that's precisely the reason we're not going to do that. And as for, you know, you mentioned that, you know, most of the liberals you know, are, are doing fine. You know, well, the, the most prominent, the most effective, and the strongest leader of the liberal opposition in Russia was Boris Nemtsov. Three and a half years ago, he was gunned down in front of the Kremlin. That is not doing fine. Or being and so poisoned, many other people. Being poisoned twice is not being fine. Because that is not fine. Is not that is not fine, fine either. And I'm, yeah. yes, I'm, yeah. I am indeed very fortunate to even be sitting here and speaking. And so many other people are in prisons, as I mentioned, almost 200 political and religious prisoners in Russia today. So, of and the, course, and we the, are not and, talking and about... And the leader of the uh, opposition, the, uh, the most popular leader of the opposition, is in and out of jail, and his brother has been in jail. He yes, he was one of those. So Naval. Oleg Navalny yeah, was yeah, one of those. Yeah. And, and Alexei Navalny just came out yesterday, so we just actually missed each other by a day. I flew in from Moscow yesterday. He just came out of prison the, the evening before. And um, uh, there was actually a count done by, I think it was Meduza, one of the independent media outlets, that he had spent about 40% of the last year those in and out small sure. jail terms. And this is presumably Monthly. an attempt to, yeah, because Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who spent more than 10 years as a political prisoner in, in Putin's Russia, he said that Navalny is basically being given the same sentence, but piece by piece. So instead of doing this big kind of, you know, sentence that would draw the attention of the whole world, they're just doing a month here, two weeks there, but the result is that he's... And his, and his brother was in a camp. And I mean, his brother was in a camp for four and a half years. Oleg Navalny recognized as a political prisoner by Memorial and other human rights groups. So, uh, you know, of course, the current regime is not totalitarian in a sense that it has mass repressions. But no, the, the opposition is not doing fine. And people who are against this regime are not doing fine. They are killed. They are kept in prison. They are harassed. They are pressured. They are attacked. That is not fine. It is a dangerous vocation to be in opposition to Vladimir Putin's regime. Let's just make that thing clear. And yet, it is amazing and astonishing that there are still so many people in Russia who are ready and prepared to stand up against this regime, including publicly, including by going to the streets. And there, I think, actually, to answer your earlier question, David, there is my source of optimism mm -hmm. for the future of our country, because in the last four years since we launched uh, Open Russia as a political movement, <coughs> this is a movement of which I'm the vice chairman, as Nina has mentioned, I've been all across our country from almost, from Kaliningrad to Irkutsk, uh, and you know, opening regional branches, holding public events, discussions, meetings such as this in, in various places all across the country. And I see so many people, including young people, who are very unhappy about the situation as, it's, as, as it is and who think that our country deserves better. And we know that our country deserves better than to have you know, a corrupt authoritarian clique ruling us for two decades now. And so that's my main source of optimism. It's, it's the people of Russia. And to answer the, uh, the question from, from a lady earlier, a student, um, first of all, the, you know, the system we have in Russia today is not a perverted democracy. It's not a democracy of any kind. It's a, it's a fully-fledged, uh, repressive authoritarian regime. And um, uh, to go back to what we were talking earlier, uh, yes, I completely reject this predeterminist argument that somehow because Russia has had so many decades and centuries of authoritarianism, we are not capable of, 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 of living in a free political system. Of course we are. And, and, and it has happened before. I mean, we did have... Uh, it wasn't a thousand years of you know, unfettered absolutism, right? We had at least 12 years at the beginning of the 20th century, a decade at the end of the 20th century. So we did have those um, periods of political freedom, including the 1990s, which was the longest continuous period of political freedom in the history of Russia. And we do know that it does work. It, it, it obviously didn't work out too well in the previous two experiments, but I think it's, it's up to us to learn from those mistakes uh, and, to, uh, and not to repeat them the next time we have that chance. Okay, so two more questions. One is the disasters and how Putin deals with it, and another one is that attention to Putin's crimes, oh, yes. if they're going Ambassador to be Wolf, advertised yes, widely, would it actually help to end the regime? Thank you. So in Kursk, uh, 
I think it's just, again, this was the first few months of Putin's uh, presidency. He was inaugurated in May of 2000, Kursk was in August. So this is just three months into his, into his, uh, into his rule. And I think that's, that whole episode showed in a nutshell his whole attitude to everything and, and the fact that human lives for him are worth nothing compared to the supposed prestige. So for him, the um, supposed loss of prestige from allowing foreigners, in that case Norwegians and the Brits, to come in and help rescue the surviving sailors, that supposed loss of prestige was worse than letting dozens of Russian sailors die a horrible death in, in, in that submarine. So that's, that's just, that showed his entire attitude that would and continues to govern you know, his, whole, his whole presidency. And of course, it's, it's not just the attitude, it's also the cynicism. You all remember the Larry King interview when he asked him what yeah, happened to the submarine. Sank. Drown, it and sank. he had a, it had a smirk sank. and it sank as if it's some kind of a joke. And also, if, as you recall, Putin didn't even break his vacation. He was in Sochi at the time. Uh, and he didn't even bother coming back to Moscow when the crisis was unfolding. So that was just an early, again, going back to what we were talking about a minute ago, that there was no early Putin that was supposedly better. No, he was the same from the beginning. But can and I just add to this, though? They did change. I mean, I think the PR system started working better. So he does go. He did go when Moscow was taken by the fires. He did go in a fire helicopter to, to do this. So, but more of it is a PR stand. It's not really an action. No, and the result is the same. Right. And very important question from Ambassador Wolfowitz It's about the need for more exposure on the international level. Of all the crimes, not just the, the original ones like the apartment bombings, but also the, conti the continuing today uh, crimes and swindles and schemes of the Putin regime. And it's all the more important to have more exposure in Western countries and Western media about this because so many of these crimes are linked and connected to the West, especially the, I'm talking about the financial crimes, certainly, because, you know, in order for those oligarchs and officials in the Kremlin to be able to steal in Russia and spend in the West, the West must allow them to do this. And, you know, there's so much talk about corruption being the biggest export from the Putin regime, right? We've all heard this, and it's absolutely true. But in order for somebody to export corruption somewhere, somebody else needs to be importing it. And we know that for every human rights abuser and corrupt official in the Kremlin, there is an enabler in the West, Western banks, Western institutions who are welcoming these people with open arms and instead, of, instead of exposing them. And the fact that they are storing these money stolen from the people of Russia, investing them in property in Florida, in this fine city where we are now, in the south of France, in London, it's beginning to happen slowly. Um, there are now six countries that have passed the Magnitsky Acts, so these laws that put at least some sort of a lid on this export of corruption and human rights abuse. And the UK, most significantly, is the latest country to pass this law. Remains to be seen how effectively they implement it, but it is really important to do this. And um, I'll give you one specific example of where this exposure uh, showed its effectiveness. So about four years ago, 2000, yeah, four years ago, in the summer of 2014, um, Senator Roger Wicker, who's a Republican senator from Mississippi, current chairman of the Helsinki Commission, wrote to the then um, uh, Attorney General, Eric Holder, asking him to authorize an investigation into the secret assets of Mikhail Lesson, who was at the time, he was a guy who died in Washington, D.C. in 2015. At the time, he was head of the Gazprom media, which is the largest Kremlin-run media conglomerate in Russia. And so this was somebody, he'd also served as press minister under Vladimir Putin. He was instrumental in helping Putin to shut down all the independent television channels. He was the main mastermind behind RT, Russia Today, the, the main Kremlin English language a propaganda outlet. So he was kind of this key figure in the repressive media environment created by the Kremlin and in the anti-Western direction uh, put forward by RT and other outlets. And yet, according to the documents that Senator Wicker obtained, the same guy, Mikhail Lessin, owned $23 million worth of real estate in Los Angeles, California, being a state official. He would have need to have worked, I don't know, for 3,000 years to afford, to afford that palace without eating a single day. And so I think it was in July or August when Wicker sent that request. I think it was in October when Lesson had to resign as head of Gaspro Media. So this is just one very, very tiny, small example of how exposure can be effective, even in the current conditions, even in the regime we have today. Unfortunately, there are not enough Senator Wickers, and there are not enough
public exposure such as this. If, if, if there were more of them, I think we would see well, a qualitative in, in, in different situation. In fairness, situation. our denunciation of, of, of uh, acceptance of, of corruption into our own economy is highly selective. Administration after administration has been indulging the Saudi regime in the same way as our putative ally. And do we share, we, 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 under the rubric of shared interests? Can I just, because this is the second time you, you, you compare. Uh, really, really quickly, because right. this is important. Before you mentioned China, now you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Now, of course, needless to say, human rights are universal, and they apply to all human beings on this earth. There shouldn't be any difference. Having said that, let us not forget that Russia is a member of the Council of Europe. Russia is a member of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The Russian Federation has undertaken clear and binding commitments in the sphere that of elections, they they in the sphere the of media, no in the sphere of rule of law. That's something that neither China nor Saudi Arabia has done. So let's not put those in the same brackets. Russia should be held to a much higher standard because it has applied this higher standard to itself. In our country, is a full member of institutions that make rule of law, human rights, and democracy the central pillar of international law. And so since those are the obligations that we have freely undertaken, we need to be held to account on those obligations. So there is no comparison with China or Saudi Arabia if only for that reason alone. Uh, thank you. I wanted to say I really enjoy the sparring quality between the two of you. I think it's very exciting. It's, it's we're, more, we're I would have stayed awake anyway, but it's kept me even more awake, actually. So, uh, I was wondering, in, you know, if, if barring you know, an unforeseen event, uh, if things go according to Vladimir Putin's plans in his uh, rule, how, what, what would you predict is his plan of succession, which has to happen? I mean, have you, I'm sure you've thought about this more than I have. Do you have any comments on that? Thank you. We'll take another question. Good question. Questions. Hi. Um, there were, you talked a lot about um, more violent KGB-style methods of uh, repressing political dissidents in Russia, but also the broad democratic movements that you see. Um, when I'm following Russia, I've seen a lot of other softer methods of shaping speech in society, such as um, issues around the app Telegram and how internet posting has become a form of political speech. So I was wondering what other ways beyond brute force are there, way, uh, are there to shape society in Russia and how would those affect broad democratic movements like the ones that you spoke about? Thank you. Thank you for being here and allowing us to hear your spontaneous thought. Welcome. Um, to follow through on the uh, lady's question, what role do you feel the internet and social media can play as an enabler to bring about liberty and freedom. I, I hesitate to use democracy because democracy has many meanings, but liberty and freedom uh, that you're trying to achieve and <coughs> how much of an enabler do you see that being and what role has it played so far in your successes? Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Three or four? No, let's do three, I guess, <laughs> Okay. it seems easier. Okay. Um, so you have succession, yes. softer methods like, uh, you know, blocking, blocking and stuff. Yeah. sensor, and, and then yeah. once yeah. again the internet. Uh, so on the question of uh, for a succession, I do not think Putin has a plan for succession. I, I think agree. he wants to stay in power for as long as he's physically alive. Uh, and the person who we thought was a successor 10 years ago turned out to be a placeholder. Um, and so I think his plan is to stay in power forever. Now, this does not mean that he will, because if it was up to dictators that wanted to stay in power forever to stay in power forever, then every dictator in the history of the world would stay in power forever. Now, we obviously know that is not the case. And there are other forces at play, uh, apart from the will of the dictator, in this case, Vladimir Putin. So um, I frankly do not think he will stay in power forever. Uh, and, but, but the thing about, as, as we already discussed at length today, it is absolutely meaningless to try to predict precisely how or when things will start happening in Russia. The only thing we do know is that things will change because nothing is, 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 is for always, forever. And um, the main kind of mission as we see it of our movement, of the Open Russia movement, is to try to prepare as much as we can today for that future transition, to try to avoid some of the mistakes that were made in the previous transitions. And many of those mistakes were made because change started happening so quickly when nobody expected it. Nobody expects it now, and yet we know it's going to come. And so we think it's important, and as a responsible political movement, we feel it is our responsibility to try to prepare for that future today. So this is what we are doing. On the uh, internet, social media question, so first on the softer, on the softer methods, 
Um, of course, they used softer methods, and, and they began with, with softer methods. The first thing Mr. Putin did when he came to power within the first three years of his rule, shut he shut down uh, all independent television stations, which let's not forget, when Putin came to power, most nationwide television networks in Russia were not controlled by the state. Only one was Russia. Right. Uh, Channel One was controlled by Berezovsky, and TV was by Gosinski, they were different ownership. And within the first three years, he managed to consolidate everything uh, under the state. So that was kind of the main soft method, I guess, the propaganda, the censorship. Um, but of course, they, they have now accelerated this to, uh, to, to, much, to much deeper, much more violent levels, where now, I mean, they still do use soft methods, but they also, of course, as we all know, they use methods that are not soft at all. Uh, on your specific question about, you mentioned Telegram, the, which is a messenger that Roskomnadzor, the government, a Russian government agency responsible for controlling internet, has officially blocked, I think it was something like six months ago. Uh, well, I, was, I came from Moscow yesterday. I can tell you that Telegram is, is working just fine. It's perfect. Uh, it works uh, great. Yeah, it's probably it's better, been probably right better than before. So better. in fact, when Roskomnadzor, uh, which again is the Russian government agency responsible for the internet, when they initially started blocking or I should say trying to block Telegram. I think they first blocked Amazon. Google. Then parts of Google. Google. They blocked a few other websites, and they ended up by blocking the website of Roskomnadzor itself. <laughs> and that is not a joke. This is what they did. So sometimes the repressiveness is compensated by the incompetence, and that's certainly the case with, with uh, Telegram Messenger. Uh, and on the lady's question about the, the importance of the internet and social media, it is hugely important. I think we cannot overestimate it. I'll, again, I'll just give one specific example. About a year ago, a little more now, a year and three months, Alexei Navalny's Anti-Corruption Foundation produced this 40-minute long investigative video uh, on Vamni Dimon. He's no Dimon to you, um, which, which the, concentrated. The yes, oh, which the was the video. The investigation was about the hidden financial empire of the current Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, showing his villas, his yachts, his bank accounts, his, his vineyards farm. in Italy, his farm. Yeah, his, uh, his little duck house and everything else. Now, of course, as you know, if you watch Russian state television, as, as David does every, every Sunday, yeah. uh, you would not hear a single word about this investigation. Needless to say, it's as if it did not exist. And yet 27 million people in Russia Watch this film on YouTube, on Facebook, on Vkontakte, which is Russian colonial Facebook, this is on the Twitter. Weird, this is the weird thing that's hard to understand for us and maybe in general. There's no such thing in China. There's no, and, and to, to, to get anything that resembles what you and I think of mm -hmm. as news, uh, dissenting opinion, all the rest in a place like China and other places, there's a kind of completist censorship. Right. Whereas in Russia, and it has to be deliberate because it's not like the Russian government is um, not knowledgeable about the technology that would be required. They're not. So, th so you still have a radio station like Echo of Moscow, which reaches a kind of older, literate, or liberal Dorst. audience. Dorst. Right. Pardon me? The Dorst. Exactly. The Rain Dorst TV. television, <coughs> which is an in internet television. And, yeah. and, and Facebook, which is not in good odor these days, but Facebook is a hugely important means of passing Absolutely. along articles among people. So when, when we say that there's no press freedom in Russia, that's both true, but it's possible to be informed, isn't it, with some effort, not on television. It is. Uh, and so the, the difference is, of course, that for about 80% of the population, television still remains the primary source of information. That's right. completely controlled by the state. But there is this unfettered free space for independent information, and this, but why I'm only it using. Why does it remain? That's that's the mystery. Well, because uh, so, first of all, just just to want this this is just I think a very good illustration of the Navalny video because this was something that was completely blacked out by the official media, not a single word about it, even in a bad sense. They didn't want right. to draw any attention, and yet 27 million people watched it in Russia, and tens of thousands went to protest back in, the, in, in right. March and June right. of last this year when the big protests began. Yes, yeah. mainly YouTube or other online platforms. YouTube was the main one. But to your question, that's actually a very important question of why this is happening in China and not happening in Russia. Because the, the Chinese regime was clever about it in a very bad way, but it was clever about it. They began controlling the internet as soon as the internet appeared. And so the controls grew as the internet grew. And so kind of for, for internet users in China, this is the quote unquote normal situation. The natural state of being. In Russia, you know, Mr. Putin's people, they just missed the moment. And now, today, we have between 65 and 70 million right. daily internet users in the Russian Federation. Good luck trying to block that like this. It doesn't work that way. They missed the moment.
So I'd like, it would be a wonderful uh, moment to conclude this very interesting meeting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, or I did. We certainly did. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Thank, thank you. you for but us. also what I was sort of going to conclude with, we come back to where we started. David asked this important question, what is Putinism? That's exactly that. Because when it is portrayed as this absolutely horrible oppression, it is, but it is also not. And that's why when I explained it, I, I said it's, go, it's more dangerous probably than Stalinism because this kind of system can last for a really long time. Remember Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore of years back? That's kind of that system that has oppression but also allows for some minimal freedoms and then can say, but we have Dorst, we have Echa Moskvi. But, but wouldn't have, Putin be thrilled to hear himself compared have, to the Singapore well, example? Well, you know, I mean, after, after a while, basically autocrats of the world unite. So right. it doesn't matter what generation they, they come from. <laughs> but what is also important is that, um, what something that Vladimir said, which is completely true, the regime, as long as it gets more ossified, the more repressive that it gets. And I think that's the danger and the question when it is going to break and how it is going to break. The break, it will. Thank you very much. Thank you.